Uh, so, very well, welcome to the General Conference building. And uh, this is a LNG White tour, so I'm gonna take you for just to see a little bit of building and a little bit of LNG White. So, this is the lobby. And, uh, and uh, yeah. Because this is the only way we can see the building, by the That's way. That's true. <laughs> because we're we are late for the, there was a morning tour for the oh, building. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so. I worked here 30 years oh, ago. Oh, you did? And they, I wandered everywhere. Yeah, now yeah. they're like. It's really tough. Like yeah, it's interesting to see some of this original artwork, too. Oh. My name is Raquel. I want to explain just a little about this room. You see that it's different, it's dark, it's dusty, it's rough for you to remember the humble beginning of the Advent movement, many of them gathering in barns like this one. We try to imitate a barn. You see many, uh, many um, tools here that they, many of them were farmers. So just to try to give you an idea about the humble beginning. We have a presentation here. You may have a seat that some people can sit here. Uh, about the life and ministry of Helen and how she had to develop this church globally. All about her early years. And you see uh, a picture of a church in the bottom center and some records at the top that tell that show Ellen White's membership in the local church with her family when she was early teen, a child. Uh, the reason that's interesting is because those are original records that the church still has. That church still exists today, and this Episcopal Methodist Church still has those records that show all their membership, including the Harmon family. But as Ellen White grew up and as William Miller started preaching, they started listening to him share about the Bible teaching that Jesus is coming again soon. And the Methodists never focused or thought about this. And they said, if you're going to follow William Miller, you cannot be members of our church. So these records here in her time with the Millerite movement show their disfellowshipping from that Methodist Episcopal Church. This is the, uh, the notes of the quarterly meeting. It starts out with their names highlighted. You can see all the Harmon family names. Uh, except for her younger siblings, are listed there as being disfellowshipped. And they're crossed off this list as well. So this panel is all about the Millerite uh, movement and Ellen White's uh, happiest years of her life is she was looking forward to Jesus coming in person again, who she had so fallen in love with as a young girl before she got ever called her to be his messenger. This is a sample of the kind of Bible studies that were produced by the Millerites with studies of Daniel and Revelation, very much like we understand them today with just the missing uh, problem of the, the identification of what was going to happen in the 1844. The Millerites taught that Jesus was coming back to this earth to cleanse the earthly sanctuary because they saw this language in the Bible. And by the way, at the end there, we see the pictures of the three co-founders of the Adventist Church on the left, James and Ellen and Captain Bates. The man on the right is very significant. Why do we put that man in? Do you know his name? Anybody recognize him? <laughs> that, that's um, the one who had the vision of the sanctuary. Yes. yes. Hiram Edison. The morning after the Great Disappointment, on the morning of October 23, when they were all just wondering what had happened, they were walking across a field to encourage some neighbors and to talk about what had happened. And suddenly, in the middle of the field, he got a, we don't think it was a true full vision, but it was a, a come some kind of awareness, a, a realization. He remembered the Bible text that talked about a heavenly sanctuary. And he says, oh, maybe it was something in heaven and not on earth. Maybe he was. So he started sharing that, those thoughts, and they, it turned our early Adventist believers towards studying out the sanctuary doctrine, which along with the Sabbath began to distinguish us from the other discouraged Millerites, some who left completely and others that followed Sunday and so forth. So anyway, that's a, a bit about Hiram Edson. Uh, this panel is all about Ellen White's call to be God's messenger, which happened when? 
it was very soon after the disappointment, just two months later in December of 1844, Ellen White was praying with some lady friends in a home near hers in Portland, Maine, when God gave her her first vision. And that's when he showed her the encouraging view of the people of God walking on a narrow path, going up, 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 following Jesus at their head. And they had a light behind them that the angel told her represented the, the midnight cry message, which was what the Millerites preached. Uh, using the parable of the ten virgins, where suddenly the bridegroom comes and the cry is, go you out to meet him. And they had thought they were going to meet him in 1844, but, but that vision, the angels and Jesus told her, that's still true. You are preparing to meet Jesus soon, just not 1844. And so uh, that vision of encouragement that we're going to see more about in our final presentation, if I can get it going, our technology is getting old and we're trying to redo a lot of our technology. Uh, but we'll try to get it going here in a minute. So uh, one interesting feature of this exhibit is that first vision that Ellen White had, she began to write it out. And she was only 17 years old. Any uh, of you young uh, people here close to 17? 17. 17. I see some young girls over there. Oh, okay. uh, there. Oh. So anyway, when Ellen White uh, wrote out that first vision, it was printed up in a form like this. And one of her early supporters named Otis Nichols took a copy of that printout and wrote a long letter to William Miller and encouraged William Miller by pointing out to him that in Joel, in the Bible, it says your young men and your young women will have visions in the last days. And he told William Miller, this young woman, Ellen White, is a fulfillment of that prophecy. She is a young woman having a vision that's encouraging us and pointing us to Jesus still. And so that's, uh, and unfortunately, William Miller did not live very long after that, so he was not able to become a Seventh day Adventist. But Ellen White saw in vision that angels were guarding his tomb and that he would be raised, raised up in the re resurrection to see Jesus coming, that he had preached so faithfully for so many years. Um, so the rest of the room, you can take time to. Uh, Explore. This is a model of the house that the Whites lived in when they were in Battle Creek. This bedroom for Ellen White up here is the room where she wrote much of the Great Controversy Vision out. This panel is all about, uh, this curved wall is all about her foreign travels to Europe on the far left, and her Australian travels here. These churches here are the ones that Ellen White started and many more in New Zealand and in Australia and the uh, the digital copy of the book you see at the top, you can go through page after page of it, shows what people wrote when Ellen White was uh, leaving Australia after almost 10 years there for that long boat trip back to the United States. And there, uh, the people wrote their messages of thanks and appreciation for Ellen White on, I don't know, 100 pages. So that every day on her uh, boat trip back to California, she could read some of those messages in that book. Um, these are the books that Ellen White completed on the life of Christ during her time in Australia. Her focus during, in Australia of her writing was all about the life of Christ. So the Desire of Ages was completed, and the two uh, add-on books. Actually, the, the Sermon on the Mount and the parables were so big that they made the book Desire of Ages too big. So that's why they were split out and put into separate books, along with a separate book on the Steps to Christ. So these are books completed during the Australian sojourn. This corner is all about uh, her oldest boy, who was the bad boy of the family. He was the disobedient one, and he was off into other things that weren't uh, really compatible with his mother's mission in the church, Edson, up until he was 40, in his early 40s, and God really converted him and changed his heart and made him want to be working fully with his mother in the church, 
And the project very creatively that he had came up with was to build a boat and go down the Mississippi River and start preaching to the black people along uh, the, the banks of the Mississippi who, and invite them out onto the boat where he had classrooms for teaching them uh, literacy skills and he used a simple version of his mother's desire of ages as a primer for teaching them how to read and about the gospel and uh, they had a health clinic on there too. So that's a, a very accurate replica of the Morning Star and, and there you see it on the Mississippi River. And, and by the way, uh, that picture, Ellen White came back from Australia in 1900. She got her retirement home. By the way, these are all the homes that Ellen White ever lived in. Pictures of her explanation of them and her home in Australia and her final home that she bought in retirement was this home in Elmshaven, which is a museum today run by the Northern California Conference that you can visit. And by the way, you can visit uh, Battle Creek, Michigan and see a wonderful vi village of all kinds of uh, Adventist homes and, and uh, explanations by a wonderful staff there that, that runs the historic Adventist village in Battle Creek, Michigan. <laughs> These are some of Ellen White's favorite hymns. This is her most favorite hymn, Jesus, Lover of My Soul. Oh, I was explaining about how Ellen White, when she retired, she bought that home in California. But she did not just sit down there and relax in a rocking chair and do some a little bit more writing. Instead, what had happened in 1902 is that our headquarters, main institutions, the publishing house, which was the biggest printing press in all of Michigan at the time, in 1902, burned down, and our uh, Battle Creek Sanitarium and Hospital, built up by Dr. Kellogg, both burned down in 1902, one at the beginning, one at the end of the year. And they saw this as a sign God said things weren't going right there. People, too many people were coming in to live in Battle Creek and uh, they needed to spread out and carry the Advent message farther afield and not clump together in one place. So, well, anyway, we do need a headquarters place. So Ellen White led our church to find a place right on the edge of Washington, D.C. Uh, just about seven or eight miles from here, uh, a place called Tacoma Park. So as you go down this hall, you look on both sides and see aspects of her ministry life. The first one being about the Great Controversy Vision. The Great Controversy Vision she had in 1858, quite early in her life. And uh, that would have been just 14 years after the Great Disappointment, I think. So anyway, God was unfolding to her the conflict between God and Satan and good and evil that happened from starting in heaven before the creation of this earth through the dark ages on this earth when the Catholic Church seemed like it was going to control and wipe out all signs of truth, but God kept faithful people that knew the truths of the Bible and the Sabbath during that dark period. And after we came after came the Protestant Reformation and then eventually the Adventist Church to complete that Reformation. But anyway, the great controversy vision continued to be expanded to Ellen White through God's con further visions and uh, revelations and through her travels in Europe to see the sites of that great controversy in terms of the Dark Ages locations where uh, the Catholic Church had people uh, in persecution and she saw firsthand these things and she continued to write the story of the great controversy that expanded into the five volumes of the Conflict of the Ages series. But starting in 1858, here is an exhibit showing the original versions of the great controversy book. The very first one she got out just the same year of the vision, 1858. She wrote a short account of that vision. And uh, this is some uh, handwritten uh, piece of Ellen White's writing that tells the story of uh, part of the Great Controversy. This is actual words from the Great Controversy book that you can find, but written in her own handwriting. 
written on the back of a hat brochure. She was very thrifty and, she, and the printing press was going to throw out some rejects from uh, printing. She says, no, let me have them. I need them for writing. <laughs> and she wrote part of the great controversy on the back of that hat brochure. <laughs> You heard in the uh, videos a little bit about the uh, publishing work. The publishing work began the earliest in 1848, less than four years after the disappointment. God gave a vision to Ellen White saying, James needs to start writing a little magazine. And to, to help explain to the disappointed Millerites, what we're discovering from the Bible. They were discovering the Sabbath. At that time though, we only had 200 Sabbath keepers in 1849 when the first issue, this is a copy of the first issue of Present Truth. When it came out, it was uh, just four years from the disappointment. So anyway, uh, the first issue had a thousand copies printed, hand addressed to all the Millerite uh, people that they could get their addresses and carried eight miles by hand to a post office were in a bag like this. Things about Ellen White's preaching ministry. Uh, on this panel here, uh, by the way, the one that asked about Loma Linda, here's a picture of Ellen White preaching at the dedication of Loma Linda. Uh, but this panel, I want to have a brief word about. It's the if I ask you to come up with some different names for Jesus or descriptions for Jesus, could you come up with five? Ten. Jesus, Messiah, Christ, Savior, King, Redeemer. Redeemer. Maybe we could get 20 or 30 if we kept thinking and writing them down. But guess how many Ellen White used in all of her life of ministry? They're all written in the back panel here. There are wow. over 880 different oh, wow. names or descriptions for Jesus that she <laughs> used throughout her writings. This panel uh, is all about Ellen White's reforms. Hey, I want to see these little 12 year olds. Okay. How would you have to like to dress up like this? Maybe for a dress up, but not every day. But that's how ladies dress every day. But Ellen White knew that that wasn't very healthy or so she helped them come up with a different and a healthier, more modest dress. And of course our whole culture was moving away, but Ellen White played her role in dress reform. But more important than that, doctors in those days were prescribing poisons for people to take when they were sick. There is a picture of a, there's a cigar up here. This is what doctors re told patients to smoke if they had lung problems. And there is strychnine, calomel, mercury, cocaine, uh, all kinds of things that we know are poisons to the body and God showed Ellen White that these were very dangerous and that instead of them people needed to use natural remedies and here is a summary of the eight natural remedies that God uh, has recommended that we use instead of uh, the drugs of course thankfully modern medicine has come up with things that are truly life-saving but there's still some dangerous drugs that we want to avoid. Uh, and Ellen White gives us some good guidelines for how to live healthy and natural. She had reforms in education. Education in Ellen White's day was based largely on Greek and Latin, the classics. Uh, and Ellen White said, there's a place for that, but our Adventist education should be Bible-based. So she moved us away from the classical education to a Bible-based Adventist education. And by the way, at the top of all of our exhibits, we try to put one quote that kind of focuses in on that aspect of Ellen White's ministry. So here she says, in the highest sense, the work of education and the work of redemption are one. So our education should not only help us with facts and knowledge but it should help draw us closer to Jesus in salvation and sharing it with others. This frame on this desk uh, was invented by Uriah Smith. Uriah Smith was a brilliant uh, Adventist uh, editor and scholar. He was an editor of the Adventist Review after James White for many years. He was an amputee. His legs above the knee so he had to use a prosthetic and he's, his prosthetic was a wooden and stiff and it wasn't comfortable 
he invented a more comfortable prosthetic with a, an articulating bending knee so that he could kneel down to pray in his, with his artificial leg. And later he patented that design and was able to sell it and make a little extra money for the church. And he also did the same with this uh, frame. Take a look at the timeline. I'm going to go down and try to get the technology working. The timeline shows every major event in Ellen White's life in the silver panels, major events in the church, in the red panels. You see vignettes, paintings, uh, depicting early Adventist events that go along with the time frame. And on the top panel, the gray panels are Ellen White's major visions, and the yellow ones are her major publications along with world events that uh, were happening at the same time. This is Rachel Oaks Preston and Frederick Wheeler. They are the first Seventh-day Adventists, kind of you could say, because, oh, or this, the church that uh, they met in is the first Sabbath-keeping Adventist church uh, in in Washington, New Hampshire. These are about Ellen White's family. Her four boys, only one of them ever had children. Willie, the youngest, he, he married uh, and had two girls, and then his wife died at 31, 32 of tuberculosis. And he went with his mother to Australia in, a 19, uh, in 1890, and there he met his second wife, and he had five more children eventually. And so all the grandkids of Ellen White come through, the youngest son, Willie. This is a video that was taken at a family reunion after 14 years after Ellen White died. Uh, her grandkids had all grown up and had gone as missionaries to different places, to different world uh, fields. These two had gone to China, Herbert and Henry. They were twin boys. And Henry was a, an avid photographer, and he even learned to take black and white movies. And what you see here are the movies he took of the family reunion when they came back in uh, 1929 and were all getting together for a picnic and, and a family reunion out at the Elmshaven farm. Uh, it's interesting to watch some of those kids. You would like to see some of the kids and their when they went swimming and the, oh, the outfits and the outfits they wore and the uh, so take a look at that and enjoy uh, that. So we, we have found one of the characters that does not fit the picture very easily, and it's this man here, uh, and you can very clearly see he does look dressed in I would say Masonic uh, you know, uniform. Uh, uniform. So you read, uh, so what is the story? His name was Nathaniel uh, Falkhead. Basically he was deep into the Masons, uh, one of the 33rd degree Masons and uh, he met with Ellen White. Ellen White cautioned him and said this is going to lead you to certain doom. You need to get out of the Masons and uh, when she was talking with him, uh, she made some hand sign that uh, she said, you need to get out of the Masons, and then made this sign. And then she said it again and made the same sign. And uh, he was shocked because I guess it was a secret sign yes. that nobody except the highest Masons orders would know. Would know. And uh, But uh, it was for him a convicting moment and then he ended up leaving the Masons and uh, oh, sent wow. her this picture to say uh, thanks for helping me recognize that yes. there's a, a better way. And I just realized this is Ellen White uh, watchdog. Tiglet pleaser. <laughs> Tiglet pleaser. Well, I did not know that part. So for everybody who's watching, you can have a made pause the video and just read this plaque here. But yeah, that's great. It is a fascinating uh, story for sure. And they broke, they broke it up into categories, you know, uh, in different spheres of public life, uh, politics, arts, religion. Science. And in religion, Ellen White got the biggest spread of all, uh, ten, nine others. Well, just in case you missed the uh, beginning of the gentleman's explanation, Smithsonian had a publication uh, in 2015, if I write, and, uh, and Ellen White made in a hundred uh, most influential people in the United States of America. So that is the, what you just saw.
uh, if you do have a chance to come and visit uh, this this painting behind, it has a really beautiful interactive uh, uh, a show with the projectors above. So. Uh, truly inspiring uh, uh, projection and the story of uh, this painting. So, if you have an opportunity, it's certainly worth seeing it. <laughs> yes, it's one of Ellen White's books in 93 different languages. And of course, it needed to be a shorter book, so we got <laughs> Steps to Christ, her most widely translated book. It's published in over 160 some languages. We got 93 of those languages here. And if you speak a, a language other than English, you can look here and find the language you know and find the place where it shows up on the, uh, the panel. And there is a little audiovisual presentation. If you touch the screen, you can bring it up in. And this is a vault, I guess, uh, because you have originals inside. And yes, yes. This is the newer vault. Well, we, we just reorganized it. And we put a partition here so that the workspace could stay separate. But Behind those glass panels is part of uh, Ellen White's original library collection. Behind her own Today, her materials continue to be safeguarded against fire or theft in the specially constructed vault. But what you see its most important collection consists of Ellen White's letters and manuscripts. The inspired Originals are ages. Oh, wow. So special. So so continues to do so through the many books and articles drawn from these writings. Today, the transcripts are filed chronologically in the two oak cabinets located behind the glass panes. She's. They could not hold her. She would just move strongly and freely, and and uh. No one could hold this Bible like this. So God gave her supernatural strength with no breath during a, her some early visions. This was to help the early church learn and appreciate that it was God's gift to her. But that's not the only test. You know, even Satan can make people be super strong for a short time. We have to have all the tests of a true Bible prophet, which mean Everything she says and writes has to be consistent with the Bible. She has to uplift Jesus, and she has to have a, a, a perfect life of, of service and ministry, which Ellen White had for 71 years before it come to pass. And actually, in the area of health is where we see that most amazingly. She identified cigarettes as being a poison and cancer-causing when cigarettes were being recommended by doctors. So God showed her things that no one knew at the time and that were true. Just for the end, uh, if you wouldn't mind just to record and just say, uh, well, just massive thank you. I don't know your name, I do apologize. <laughs> I'm Larry Cruz. I have been with the White Estate about 29 years helping uh, support uh, the uh, directors and the visitors. I created the original Ellen White CD-ROM working with the White Estate. That was my end to the White Estate. I helped uh, develop the original electronic database. database. And, that, uh, and which part of this? Will... In 1990 is when it came out on a CD. Okay, I, I probably saw the CD as I was a teenager at that stage, and uh -huh. I remember so, uh, quite a few things coming out of this uh, beautiful establishment. It all works here. And so, um, uh, for there, anybody who had no chance to visit this, uh, you know, maybe what is the, the highlight for you in this exhibition here? Because I'm sure you'll be able to, uh, there may be one piece <laughs> that you love the most. Is this. Well, uh, I, I'm not uh, focused on one thing so much is how all of it comes together to uplift Jesus and, and his messenger, Ellen White, as a true uh, prophet for our last days. The total pick package you have to experience. Yourself, yes. Uh, one physical object that we have connected with Ellen White and James is in the lobby. It's the chair that James White wrote in. Okay, okay. <laughs> And Ellen White certainly must have sat in that chair also. Yes. Uh, James White was amazing, amazing. guy. 
So I just want to say a massive thank you and thank you so much for the time you spent with us here and for this beautiful presentation. For everybody who has chance, we would encourage you to come and join us uh, here as we share the story of Jesus and certainly of Alan G. White and all uh, people who are involved in sharing gospel. Amen. Come and see us at the White Estate and then go and share and go and tell. Yes.